All right, students. So in this final video for topic uh, topic eight, uh, in particular sections uh, eight point five and eight point six, I'm going to talk to you about um, something called black body radiation, the Stefan Boltzmann law, Wien's law, and uh, I'm going to end with energy balance and climate models and kind of what it all means and, and wrap it all up in terms of what it means. Uh, for making the earth a habitable place for us human beings, okay? So I'm going to start first by talking about black body radiation and the Stefan Boltzmann law. Um, re remember that uh, solids can absorb a large range of electromagnetic radiation due to their molecular structure, okay? Now, you know that gases can also absorb EM radiation, but only at certain frequencies. So the other thing is when anything absorbs any electromagnetic radiation, it, it acquires temperature and then re-radiates re in the infrared part of the spectrum, okay? So all bodies at any temperature radiate energy as electromagnetic waves, okay? So this is fire, a cup of hot tea, the sun, whatever, okay? We've, we've talked about emission and, and absorption spectra. The emission spectrum for a solid is therefore continuous, okay? So there are no black lines. Um, uh, so forth, okay? Now, the emission spectrum for a gas is not continuous, and I suppose this would actually be an absorption spectrum. Nevertheless, it depends on how you're, um, how you're thinking about it. The point is that you won't see the black or colored lines for, uh, for a solid, but you will for a gas. Um, and the fact that the emission spectrum for a solid is continuous is actually a very important thing for us, okay? And I'm just going to give you the Stefan Boltzmann law of radiation right up, okay? We've talked about this a little bit in class already. So uh, Stefan Boltzmann says the following, the radiant energy Q emitted in a time T by an object that has a Kelvin temperature big T, surface area A and the emissivity E is given by this equation equation. I'm not going to derive this for you. Notice that the temperature in Kelvin is raised to the fourth power. Uh, the sigma here is called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Of course, that will always be given to you. Now, this is radiant energy emitted in the time t. Obviously, if we divide both sides by little t, then we get a power because before on the left-hand side, we had energy. Okay, so this is really the version of the Stefan Boltzmann law that we will, um, that we will probably use more often in this class is P equals emissivity times sigma times the area of the radiator times the Kelvin temperature to the fourth power. Okay, so different things have different emissivities. So for this thing called the black body, which I'll talk about in just a second, the emissivity is one. We usually simplify things by treating like things like like the sun and the earth as um, things that have an emissivity of one. Um, but different things have different emissivities. So e an emissivity of one means uh, something is a perfect emitter of radiation. It turns out, turns out it's also a perfect absorber of radiation. It means it's dark and dull, okay? So think of like, uh, I don't know, like black felt, for example. Uh, if you have an emissivity of zero, that's a really poor emitter. That's super smooth and shiny, okay? All right, and just remember the Stefan Boltzmann law here. Okay, so if I have a silver-coated block and a, and a, and a, and a black-coated block and I put them in the sun, obviously the black one is going to rise higher than the silver-coated one because the black one has a high emissivity and the bottom and the silver one has a low emissivity. So the concept of emissivity is kind of similar to albedo but reverse if you think about it. Okay, Now, if you consider any object of emissivity E at T1 and surroundings kept at T2, the object radiates power according to this version of Stefan Boltzmann. It absorbs power, I'm calling it Pn at this rate. Okay, The net power lost by the body is, uh, is P out minus Pn, that's this expression right here. If the body loses as much um, energy as it gains, then this is equal to uh, zero, and the only way that's going to be the case is if T1 is equal to T2 and the temperature is constant, okay? So anyway, a good absorber is a good emitter and vice versa, and black objects are nearly perfect emitters and can be treated as such. Okay, so here's your formal definition of this kind of weird thing called a black body. What it is, it doesn't really exist in reality, but we but we idealize it and we treat certain things as if they're black bodies because it makes the math and the physics a little bit easier, okay? It's an idealized physical body that absorbs all the incident electromagnetic radiation and re-emits re all of this radiation when kept at a constant temperature. And a perfect absorber is a perfect emitter, which I've alluded to before right there. That's very important, okay? Now, the energy radiated by a body at 
a, a temperature is just distributed over all the wavelengths, but it's always concentrated right around one wavelength, and, and it's determined by the temperature. Turns out that all bodies do not emit all wavelengths equally, okay? Now, if you notice from this, this is a very famous curve uh, graph, which you'll see a lot in this class, okay? And it's a graph of intensity of uh, radiation against the wavelength. So you can see that a couple of things happen as the temperature of the body goes up. And this is like anything radiating at this temperature, okay? Um, you can see that as the temperature goes down, okay? As the temperature, as the temperature goes up, oh, this is probably easier to think, if the temperature goes up, you see how the peak of the curve not only becomes sharper, Okay, compare that sharpness of that curve to the sharpness of that curve, but it also goes to the left along the x-axis, which means that the uh, wavelength, the maximum wavelength, um, goes down, okay? And as the temperature goes down, uh, the maximum wavelength goes up, and the height of the peak increases, okay? All right? Um, or actually decreases, sorry. As the wavelength goes up, the height of the peak decreases, okay? And we'll uh, look at this again. I'll show you some comparisons between some different bodies at different, different temperatures. So um, really, really cool curve. Uh, there was a lot of science that went into figuring out these curves and to figure out these uh, relationships between intensity and the wavelength of um, emitted radiation by an object at that temperature. Now, it turns out that there is a mathematical equation relating the maximum um, wavelength to the Kelvin temperature, and that's called Wien's displacement law. And it just says that lambda max is a constant over temperature, and that constant is 2.9 times 10 to the minus 3 meters times Kelvin. I just want to remind you the visible spectrum here. We're going to uh, use this quite a bit in this in this video. Okay. For a body at room temperature, which is about 293 Kelvin, it turns out that most of the uh, most of the wavelength, most of the radiation that that body is emitting, is in the infrared, so we don't see it. Okay, so 293 on this curve, on this graph over here, would be way, way over to the right. Okay, because this graph right here is 3500 K. Okay. All right. Now, when a rod of metal is heated to around 1,000 Kelvin, it starts to glow red. Okay. Now, although the most intense part of the spectrum is not in the visible region, there is enough visible red light to make the rod glow. Okay. All right. Now, the Earth's surface at 288 Kelvin emits radiation at about a maximum wavelength of 1 times 10 to the minus 5 meters, which is in the infrared. Okay. Which is the whole basis behind the greenhouse effect, as we've discussed. The sun's surface at 6,000 K emits radiation at about 5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters or about 500 nanometers, which is right in the visible part of the spectrum, which is really good for us um, and, and life on Earth. Okay. Now, this graph here is showing your black body curves, the intensity against wavelength. I, I call these curves all lots of different things. You hear them called black body curves for different surfaces at different t emissivities at the same temperature. So think about that statement, okay? So you have something at the same temperature for different emissivities. These would be the uh, different curves. So as the emissivity goes down, okay, then the, the, uh, the actual peak of intensity actually goes down, which makes sense. So the effect of decreasing emissivity is to flatten the curve. And obviously, each of these have, have the same lambda max because um, lambda max depends on temperature only. In fact, it's inversely proportional to temperature, as we discussed. Okay. All right. So when we analyze the intensity against wavelength curves for the uh, um, electromagnetic radiation emission, we always treat the body as a black body. Okay. So here are some curves just to um, compare things for you. Okay. Um, and this is from the FET simulation, which you should play around with uh, on the website. So here's the um, Here's the black body curve for the sun. Okay, notice the units are slightly different than before, but we don't really care about the units. We're going to look at the relative, um, the relative shapes of these different curves for different things. Okay, so here's the sun at 6,000 Kelvin. There we go. So most of what it emits is in the visible part of the spectrum, which is why we see, which is why sunlight helps us so much. Okay, all right. Now, if we bring down that temperature to be around the temperature of a light bulb, which is about 3,000 Kelvin. You see what happens is not only does the peak get much lower, but the peak flattens out and moves to the right. Okay, so the wavelength goes up. All right, which means the frequency goes down. All right. If we take it even farther, we go down to an oven at about 650 K. Note that I've changed the y-axis scale. 
you see how far away we are from the visible part of the spectrum. Okay, Re remember that this graph here is scaled differently than the first two. Okay, and then um, the uh, for the Earth, which is even lower temperature at about 300 K. It's an even, even farther from that visible part of the spectrum. It's way out here on very, very, very long wavelengths, so very, very low frequencies, which are in the infrared part of the spectrum. Okay, so really cool. You should play around with that FET simulation um, to look at different radiation curves. All right. Okay, so just a little more detail on the solar radiation curve because, of course, that's what impacts so much of our life on the Earth. All right. Okay, in a little more detail. Okay. This is a cool sort of breakdown of the um, of the intensity against wavelength for the sun. Okay, note that what note what happens in the upper atmosphere and the lower atmosphere. Okay, you get these um, absorption bands in the lower atmosphere. Okay, the lower or near here it says sea level is the red part. And the yellow part is, is what's happening at the top of the atmosphere. Okay, so turns out that um, turns out that um, ozone, oxygen, and water vapor have different um, absorption properties at different wavelengths. So here's your oxygen and your water vapor in the lower atmosphere here, and your ozone in the higher atmosphere there. Okay, and I've shown you lots of cool graphs about solar insulation um, around the Earth. Okay, so just to remind you, this is um, this is what I guess monthly solar ins insulation between. January and April on average, okay, and look at the effect of the atmosphere, in particular the water vapor, which is clouds, right, has a huge effect on what happens on the surface of the earth. And remember that water vapor is a very highly, the most effective greenhouse gas there is, okay? Okay, so here's an example I'd like for you to do on your own, okay? Very qualitative, all right? Okay, so if all objects radiate E and M energy, why don't the objects around us in, in everyday life grow colder and colder and colder? Pretty good question. Well, it turns out that objects absorb E and M energy from surroundings. If both the object and the surroundings are at the same temperature, energy is emitted and absorbed at the same rate by these different things. If the object is hotter and heat is not applied to it, the object radiates more energy than it absorbs and cools down to the temperature of the surroundings. So in a way, that's sort of a conservation of energy, if you think about it, all right? Try example three. Okay, so red star, it turns out we haven't studied astrophysics, but stars have different colors, okay? If a red star and a white star radiate energy at the same rate, can they be the same size? If not, which must be larger, okay? Remember, the size is dictated by the A in the Stefan Boltzmann law, okay? The red star must be cooler than the white star. So if it is to radiate energy at the same rate, it must have a larger surface and hence larger surface area, okay? All right? <laughs> and remember, here's Wien's displacement law right here. Okay, so you want to think about these sort of qualitative answers that I provided. You know that in this part of the course, the IB really is looking for qualitative answers, not so much analytical or quantitative, although I'm going to do a few more of those kinds of examples here um, in the next slide, okay? All right, so let's start really basic and go back to kind of basics. I know that you know how to do this, but I'm just going to review. Um, go ahead and read this, this uh, example. Okay, the amount of energy in one photon of light, remember E equals HF or HC over lambda. I got 3.3 times 10 to the 19, negative 19 joules, which what I guess is about two, a little bit less than two electron volts, okay? Now try this one, the temperature of the surface of the sun. Okay, use Wien's displacement law to calculate the most intense wavelength. Again, very, very simple. Uh, lambda max is about 480 nanometers. It turns out this is not really in the yellow because the temperature of the sun, this is, a, this is actually somewhat of a high estimate. It's really about 5,800 um, Kelvin. But anyway, it's right there in the visible part of the spectrum. This is a little bit sort of between green and yellow. All right. Okay, now this, this example is a little more interesting. Try this one on your own. Okay, this, I give you the sun's radius. We say it can be treated as a black body. Use Stefan Boltzmann to calculate the power per square meter emitted from the sun. Well, the power per square meter is just Stefan Boltzmann minus the A on the right-hand side. I got 7.35 times 10 to the 7 watts per, um, watts per square meter. Okay, what's the total energy radiated by the sun? Well, that is the power. That is this equation right here, and that's a lot. That's 4.5 times 10 to the 26 watts, all right? Okay, here's a, a much more interesting question, getting a little more complicated here. It's about the star Betelgeuse. It turns out that Betelgeuse is a supergiant star, 
we know its surface temperature. Okay, it's about one half the surface temperature of our sun. It emits radiant uh, a radiant power about one uh, about ten thousand times greater than that of our sun. Assuming it's a black body and spherical, find its radius. Okay, try this one on your own. Okay. So your radius is embedded in that a, a variable on the right-hand side. All you do is you solve for r. I got 3 times 10 to the 11 meters. Um, that's the radius of the star. Now just to put things in perspective, okay, uh, the radius of Mars is about 2.3 times 10 to the 11. The average radius of the Earth is about 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. Okay, this is a really big star, and we're lucky that our star is not a supergiant, although someday our sun will probably become a supergiant, but we're not going to be around to uh, witness that. Okay, okay. Another example. Try this one. Okay, this is really uh, sort of a problem dealing with, I guess, the conservation of energy. We have an unused wood burning stove, has the, having a constant temperature, which of course is the temperature of the room. Now we're dealing with an emissivity of not not equal to one. Uh, we know the surface area of the stove. What's the net radiant power generated by the stove when there's no wood in it? Okay, all right. Well, I got 1,280 joules by Wien's law. Okay, that's just this lump of metal that's sitting there radiating at an emissivity of 0.9. Okay, now the net power generated by the stove is the power emitted by the stove minus the power emitted by the room and absorbed by the stove. It's the conservation of energy, right? It's 1280 minus 1280. It turns out that there's no net power generated by the stove. And this is the reason why it goes back to that first example that I did, that qualitative answer about how, how come things aren't getting colder and colder and colder without limit. Well, this is the reason why. When something emits, something absorbs and vice versa. So we have to think about the system and its surroundings, not unlike what we did when we studied thermal physics and thermodynamics, okay? Okay, we'll talk a little bit now about energy balance and climate models very briefly. Okay, you should be aware again that at the top of the atmosphere, the ozone absorbs mainly UV and X ray radiation. About 20% of the incoming radiation is absorbed by ozone at the top. The lower atmosphere, it's water and carbon dioxide that absorb the infrared radiation, about 30%. Okay, so about 50% of the incoming solar uh, radiation actually makes it to the surface. Okay, now the Earth has a constant average temperature of about 15 degrees Celsius, so it's about 293 Kelvin, and it actually acts as a black body. So because it acts as a black body, we can assume that the power in equals the power out. Okay. Now, here's something I haven't really shown you guys. Different layers of the atmosphere, the troposphere, the stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, so forth. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the ozone layer, you've heard about the ozone layer. That's considered the top of the atmosphere. Okay which actually in this grand scheme of layers is not that high okay but we treat it as the upper atmosphere okay now this graph here is very interesting this is showing you the percent absorbed um, for different parts uh, for different regions of the spectrum in different parts of the atmosphere so here's your ozone your ozone absorbs most of the UV right here okay and your carbon dioxide and your water absorb most of the infrared what absorbs the visible well, not much, which is why we see, which is why there's a lot of visible light on the Earth. That's, that's really good for us as human beings, okay? Now, again, Earth has a constant uh, average temperature, acts as a black body. So since uh, the intensity is power over area, and albedo is reflected power over total incident power, the power delivered to, the, to a surface area can then be... Um, can then be quantified as 1 minus the albedo over A. Okay, So this is a super simple model. Okay, It doesn't account for many factors such as, as an atmosphere. Okay, So in the simplest sort of Sankey diagram, I guess you can think of for the Earth, if there's no atmosphere, the total energy in equals the total energy out. And here's you 1 minus alpha times I, um, <clears throat> which is what we talked about in this equation right here. Okay. Now, um, here's the Senke diagram uh, with the atmosphere taken into account. Okay. So here you go. So um, you can actually come up with an albedo for the atmosphere based on this diagram, which I will, I will show you in the next slide. Okay. Um, and these, uh, these are all from your Hamper textbook. The 342 that's coming in from the sun, where he gets that is that's the actual watts per square meter 
um, that's average over the entire sphere of the Earth from the Sun. Remember the um, the solar constant is 1380 watts per square meter. And now again with an atmosphere but with no greenhouse effect you have a situation like this. Now with the greenhouse effect it becomes it, it gets more complicated. First of all we can calculate the albedo of the Earth from the Sankey diagram noting that a total of 342 units come in and a total of 107 units go out. <coughs> now <clears throat> Albedo doesn't take into account the uh, units that are coming out <clears throat> because of greenhouse gases and, re and the re-radiation of infrared radiation by the Earth, okay? Now, <clears throat> you should study this uh, Sankey diagram carefully and note a couple of things. <clears throat> Most importantly, that there's now more energy in the atmosphere than the original 342 watts per square meter, and that's because of the greenhouse effect. That's what we've been talking about the whole time with the greenhouse effect. And this little squiggly line right here, this is energy, this represents energy partly lost by convection and phase change of seawater, liquid to vapor. Remember how much is it 70% of the Earth is covered by oceans, so this phase change of seawater um, is actually really, really important in the energy balance of the Earth. The whole point is to show you how sort of fragile and precise the whole energy balance is. And if we mess, mess with the greenhouse gases, this whole balance gets out of whack and things get abnormal and bad for us as humans, okay? Here's another detailed, even maybe even more detailed Sankey diagram from your SOCOS textbook. Uh, and the total incoming intensity here is 100 units, <clears throat> slightly different than the previous one, but the bottom line is the same. You end up with, with more energy in the atmosphere than, than what is just coming in, okay? 